list of vocabularies. Okay. Uh, I'm happy to say I did not collect as many as as many words as I used to. So we should go through this a little bit quicker. Uh, but before I do that, I want to show you this thing, which means that I did watch something about the Olympic Games. So this Olympic Games, first of all, is called the 2020 Olympic Games, even though it is now taking place right now uh, in 2021, because it was postponed from last year. And in the, of course, in the, the Olympic Games, you have lots of swimming events. And uh, when it comes to swimming, of course, you see lots of white people swimming. And occasionally you see Asian or some light colored people swimming, but very, very rarely do you see black people swimming. Uh, of course, it's happening right now. Lots of, not a lot, but some black people are participating in uh, swimming events. And uh, this picture is about one woman who is not only black and participating in the swimming events, she also promotes this kind of swimmers caps, yo yo mao, huh? And this is designed just for black people because black people have this distinct difference that they, their hair is very, poking outwards, large hair, which is very hard to control with a regularly store-bought uh, swim cap. So this is one which is called the soul cap. And last, name, last time I was talking about the word soul. Anything that has something to do with Black people, they like to put the name soul in front of it to distinguish it as something different from your regular white or yellow people's thing like food or dress or hair or whatever. So here is the word soul and the soul cap is the brand name of this kind of the swimmer's cap, uh, which handles this uh, black people's hair very competently. Uh, however, it was banned by the Olympic Games because they think they're suspicious. They've never seen this before. Uh, they're not used to it and they don't see why anyone would need to wear something that's so different. And there must be something suspicious about it. Maybe it helps you swim faster or whatever it is. But they being in charge of the games, they just flat out banned this kind of cap to be used. We, I found it very strange. Uh, uh, this is what I, as a, my philosophy in life, I am always against the people who are powerful or rich or wealthy or uh, in high places. And they think that I can say anything I want and other people must follow my rules. So for no good reason at all, they decided to ban this, this kind of swim, swim caps. Uh, okay, uh, this kind of cap, as I, the caption says, so cap is an extra large silicone covering designed specifically to protect dreadlocks, weaves, hair extensions, braids, and thick and curly hair. All these uh, words about hair is about black people's hair because their hairs are, uh, as we say, like uh, shaking or, or brittle and uh, curly and hard to control. And that is uh, a very distinct problem. And uh, being this kind of thing is, specifically related to black people 
it becomes something of an issue. So it becomes political. Okay, that's all I want to say. I just find it very strange. I also learned that in the army, when they used to have uh, not too many black people and uh, all the big, bigger people, people in the army were, were white, they were very controlling and they were, uh, they just consider that black people are under them, below them. So they do not want black people to wear hair that tells people they are black. They have to shave all their hair. If you're a white person and you have whatever hair they consider beautiful, you're okay to do it whatever you like. I mean, under certain rules. But when black people come in with the big hair, so-called big hair day, or they 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 were forced to change their hairstyle in order to follow the rules that were handed down by the white people. This is just another new new thing that I find very strange. Oh, okay. Let's start with my uh, vocabulary. The first one is a grain of salt. When you're listening to somebody say something, you don't know if that is true. So you have to take it with a grain of salt, which means you have to be very careful when you uh, accept such as facts or not. And you have to uh, uh, not really take everything that was given to you as granted. You have to be more skeptical. Huh? Here's the word skeptical, which means having doubt, be suspicious, and not interpret something literally. Do not take it word by word, whatever the person says, you don't just accept it, whole, the whole thing of it. This is called the, to uh, take something with a grain of salt. And where does this term come from? It has a very, very long history. And uh, we are not very sure about who, which one is correct. But the examples they mentioned goes back at least 2,000 or even 3,000 years and from the Roman Empire. So it, it's pretty old, I would say. They mentioned. Uh, Pliny, who is a historian in the Roman Empire, and he died in the year 79 AD uh, during the Vesuvius volcano eruption. He had uh, asthma and he could not breathe well, and he died while he was trying to escape it. That was the volcano in Pompeii. You have heard of that, I hope. Pompeii such as Gucheng Mo Ruji, or it's a huge volcanic eruption in early Roman Empire in, year, in the year 79 AD, okay. And uh, so whatever he said may or may not be the source of this term, but there are other things that were mentioned in Wikipedia as well. Uh, in the old-fashioned English units of weight, a grain, a grain weights approximately 65 milligrams, 就是五,六十五公克重的东西叫做一个grain, and if it's salt, it's just about a pinch. So they say either a grain, grain of salt or a pinch of salt. Uh, in England, they like to say a pinch of salt, take it with a pinch of salt. But in America, we like to say, take it with a grain of salt. And they both kinds of uh, terms, uh, the, the way of speaking is, uh, they, they are both from, uh, ancient Roman Empire, okay? 
Uh, it was in Latin word uh, sal, sal or sa, sal, means salt, and also means wit. When you say take it with a grain of salt, you mean actually salt, or you mean wit. You have to use your head. Uh, the two words are the same in the Latin language. So it, salt also means wit. Uh, so, okay. Next one is to prime. And I showed you a lot of pictures from Google images about how to prime a water pump. When you pump water, if the shaft is empty, is Empty means uh, it's a tube or a tunnel or something with no water in it. It's just air. Then it's very hard to pump water from lower up. But if this shaft is filled with water, then it's very easy to pump water. So when we do something, we want to prime the pump. What the, it means to get the thing ready so you can start doing something. So to prime means to to prepare, to make ready, to instruct beforehand is to, to get the instruction before you actually start to do something. Or as a coach, coaching you to do something so that you know how to do it. Now, all these things you, know, you can say to prime a person for a certain job. A shell is a, you go to the beach and you can pick up shells. It could be a bivalve, which means uh, 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 or it could be a snail, which is not uh, two-sided. And these are all shells. And you could also have a, a uh, crab shell or shrimp shell, which just means a hard casing. However, it can also mean cannon shell, which means a bomb or a bullet uh, with the casing outside. When you shoot or ignite a bullet or shoot a gun or something, the shell is left behind and the dynamite would explode and cause something bad, okay? So you have shell, which in this case, it means either the bomb's shell or the bullet's shell. And it can also mean a verb, which means to shell a city, that is to, to shell with bombs into a city, that is to shell, that, that, that's a, the verb shell. And of course, when you bomb somebody, you are going to cause damage to the person or to the building. And when a person was being hit by a bomb or a gun, gunshot, then this person could be become damaged in certain ways. And when we say damage, it could be severely damaged or not too severely. But when you use the word maim, that means very seriously damaged by some kind of weapon. And it can mean losing a lot, uh, one arm of both arms or legs or large parts of the body. So we don't use this word lightly the damage has to be severe in order to be called the, the maiming, huh? uh, to wonder seriously, to cause permanent loss of function of a limb or part of the body. Huh? A limb is a body. We, each person normally has four limbs, two arms and two legs, and each one of them can be called a limb. And sometimes you can use that to mean a branch of a tree. Now this word is pronounced key, whether it's spelled Q-U-A-Y or C-A-Y. And it is a motto, a dock, 
but it is a well-constructed motto instead of a, a, a piece of board with some planks uh, or that kind of a motto. Huh? So you, if you go sh sh fishing, you could go to a dock that is just a little piece of wooden structure out into the sea. But if, if it's a dock for a bigger boat or a really, really large, like a cruise ship, then the, the dock has to be huge and very well constructed. When you say key, it's usually a better dock, not a wooden one. It's usually a concrete or metal platform. In, on the place where ships or boats sail and they could, the ship or boats could stop by this key in order to load or unload people and merchandise. So this kind of structure uh, in the harbor is called a key, whether, how, however you spell it. And last time we were talking about uh, Sydney, Australia, it has a big ferry dock that's called the circular key. Uh, an alternative word to say dock could be a wharf, fisherman's wharf, pier, dock, marina, jetty. They are all similar words, but they are different in size and function. Uh, we're, we were also talking about a ship docked at the at a dock, okay, or at a, a key, uh, and people would descend from the ship to the land. And some kind of device should be put down there so that people can just easily walk down instead of jumping over it. Uh, when the ship is quite big, you need a good ramp. Uh, when you say a ramp, it is this kind of device, but it could be any kind of ramp and any kind of uh, uh, construction. Uh, but when you say gangway, you really mean a ramp that is laid down from a, a big ship to the land. So when uh, gangway means a ramp from the ship. Uh, there are other ways, uh, other words to express this concept. A ramp, a gang letter, letter a passage, passageway, an aisle, uh, or a thoroughfare. Uh, so what's, not all of them means uh, from the ship, but they can be used that way. Uh, you can see on the right-hand side, there's a word aisle, A-I-S-L-E, uh, that the most common interpretation for that word is a narrow lane in the church. So you have rows of benches in the church, people can sit down to worship or say prayer. And there are a narrow uh, alley in between the rows of benches that, that's typically called an aisle. But in this case, it mentioned that you can also say aisle for something, some kind of ramp from the ship. Uh, this word is futile, which means useless. So in Chinese, it would be wu yong, or wang ran, or tu ran. Useless, worthless, needless, ineffective, of no use. Okay. Uh, this word, I think we should all know, but we don't always know that. It's called the diaspora. Uh, in the old times, uh, there was an ancient country called the Jewish country. Or you can say it's a Jewish state. Uh, it's either called the Ju Judea or Israel, or there are other names for it. And that it, they had the, the greatest uh, religion in the world came out of that. Jewish Bible, and then uh, Jesus Christ became the 
the center of focus for all the people who became Christians. And when we talk about the history of the Jewish people, they had a very long history, about four, 4,000 years. And uh, at one time between seventh and eighth centuries BC, uh, they were invaded by, uh, how do you call that? <laughs> I drew a blank. Uh, but could somebody help me? Uh, have you heard of uh, not Nabucco? Nah. I, I can't believe nobody can help me with that. Uh, Babylon, okay. Uh, <laughs> Babylon, okay. Uh, this country of Babylon was under the ruler uh, Nabuchadnezzar, okay. And he came, he and his troops, his armies came and conquered the Jewish state of Israel and the Judea, I suppose. And they captured all the, and they took away like 20,000 of the elites, the most knowledgeable, powerful, and the wealthy people in this land. They took them all. And up to that point, there was a Jewish Bible, which was called either Torah or uh, Old Testament. Anyway, they, they did not have it written. So after that, the, they started to write it down and the world started to learn about the Jewish Bible. Uh, however, if you have seen Giuseppe Verdi's opera Nabucco, which I just mentioned, it was a story about this ruler who captured all these elite from Israel and enslaved them and one day he saw the light. He, he converted, he said himself converted to the Judaism and uh, he released all these uh, Jewish people back into this country, uh, the, their original country, which is Israel. But what I'm going to say is the word diaspora. It was not at that time that the world knows the word diaspora. It was until uh, about Jesus' time, the uh, Roman Empire occupied Israel. They had this uh, Herod, who, what, who was, that's the name of uh, the ruler, put in the, that place by the Roman Empire. And in Chinese, we call it Xilu Wang or Xiluo Wang. Uh, this king is called Herod. However, he, his control of the land was not good and the people were unhappy. So in the year 69 AD or something, sometime after Jesus died, uh, the Jewish people came up to rebel against the Roman Empire. And because of that, the Roman Empire swooped in and uh, totally defeated the Jewish people. And since then, there was not a Jewish state in the world for 2000 years until 1948. So this is where this word comes from, the diaspora of Jewish people since the year 70 AD, when the Roman Empire crushed the state, the, the uprising of the Jewish people in Israel. And uh, since then, you can see Jewish people all over the world, as often as Chinese people. Chinese people and the Jewish people have two things, or more than two things in common. They both have very long history. And in this long history, Many, many times the people were forced to emigrate to other countries because the situation in, the, in their own country was so bad. 
so poor, so uh, repressive, and so on. So there are many, many groups of Jewish people scattered all over the world. It's just about everywhere you can you go to, you can find Jewish people who were expelled or who escaped from their own land to some remote part or some very thriving big cities in the world. And these kind of group of people who ran away from, the, from Israel, maybe long ago or recently, this kind of community is called a diaspora. And this kind of people are called the, the, the people of groups. It, it could be the community or the group of people. Uh, when you come to think about it, the Chinese uh, in, in Taiwan, the government formally has all these cabinet posts, so many departments of interior or, or foreign affairs and so on, but Chinese has a very different uh, cabinet post that it or a department in the administrative branch that is called the, the Bureau of People Living Overseas, or maybe they should use the word diaspora, because in our culture, we know about this concept very, very well. Lots of people, including ourselves, every one of us, we are in a group of Chinese people living outside China or Taiwan, or, or for that matter, you can say many th such things about many big places like Singapore or, or New York City. So this is the word diaspora, which means the community of people from a certain country who live outside their country, okay? Uh, in the beginning, this word was created to describe the Jewish people, but of course, uh, this being a very turbulent world, we can use this word to apply to many other people. And the reason I mentioned it last time is because, uh, ah, I'm sorry, I'm confusing it with my travel class. I was talking about Armenia in my travel class last week, and it was about the Turkish Empire massacring, okay, ING, huh? the Armenian people as a result, large amount, a large number of Armenian people escaped the land to avoid being killed. And they settled down in many different places. Uh, foremost among them would be United States. We have a large group, large groups of Armenian diasporas scattered in the United States. So the third bullet means it can be applied to any kind of people who are dispersed. Dispersed in, means to spread around, scattered, okay? Now, this is a simple adjective, rusam. Uh, uh, oftentimes you watch the TV or, or movie, uh, there's something terrible happened that they could use the word gruesome to describe it. It has also other similar meaning, not necessarily violent, but it could be dark and turbulent and awesome, ghastly, monstrous, horrifying, appalling, frightful. All these uh, could mean gruesome. Uh, we talk about some kind of story and the protagonist would be the hero in this book, in this story, fiction. Well, it could be nonfiction as well, but mostly we say the protagonist of a fiction. And if it's a real people, uh, you can also use this word, for example, the last four years until 
Biden became president, uh, Donald Trump was the protagonist in the long running political story in the United States. And uh, as he would like to say, he's the leader of the land, but he's certainly the protagonist. Lead, leading role, conductor, leader. These are all similar words. And devastate means to ruin it very in a great on a great scale and on a large scale. Uh, so you don't say that when your desk is not clean, you would say the tornado or the volcano devastated the the city or the, the town or whatever it is. So devastate means a very, very severely uh, destruction. Uh, devastate is a verb, of course. So to name the synonyms, you would say destroy, ruin, ravage, trample. Trample in the beginning means to step on, but it has to be an elephant or something in order to trample somebody. Destruct. Uh, blemish is to make it, to ruin the look. Uh, when we have a beautiful young girl with some uh, black head, or something, we could call that a blemish. However, all the other words are much more severe than the word blemish. A diviner is somebody who could uh, predict the future or to tell you uh, what to do because of the change in the future and so on. And this word comes from divine. Divine means a holy, heavenly. Huh? So if somebody could tell the future, then he must be someone divine. And the divine is also an adjective, a noun, and a verb. Uh, because it was a verb, so it can be turned into a di diviner, which means a person who could divine. And last time we talked about that because we were talking about Russell Crowe in the movie called uh, The Water Diviner or something. He was the, this kind of person in Australia who could uh, find water for your farm. So people who own a farm and wanted to have a source of water, they would hire a water diviner who would come with some branches, willow branches that's shaped like this uh, with two prongs. And this div water diviner would hold this and walk on the land. And when this kind of fork was going one way or another, that means there's water beneath. So he would advise the farmer to dig a hole in order to find the water. And it seems that there's some truth in that, even though I think it's lacking scientific evidence anyway. So that's a diviner and that's just one of the diviners. In the past, there was once I gave you a list of like, like 70 different names for the word diviner, because people can tell future by using any kinds of things. Uh, they could say, oh, this, because of this, oh, uh, because this tea leaf, I read the tea leaf, or I read the palm, and they, they can tell the future by looking at hundreds of different things. And this word is debut or debut, or any of those ways you can pronounce it. Because it's a French word and that U is pronounced U, so it's debut. But uh, of course, uh, you can pronounce it any way you like. It is the first public appearance of a person or a thing. So, if you're an actor and you've never been hired to play a role in the movie, then the first movie you're in, it's your debut as an actor in the movie. Or if you're a painter and you 
hold the first uh, art show of your work works, then that's your debut as an artist. You you understand what I mean? So that's the first appearance of a person or a thing. So it can be a product as well. The last bullet says product launch launch. So when they first have say an Apple phone, they would announce it and that would be the product launch. And uh, that's the debut of an Apple phone. Uh, if it's a mag magazine, it could be a de debut issue, the first issue of a comic book series or such things. Or if you are an, a novelist, you keep writing and the first book you publish is your first novel, debut novel. Uh, and for a young girl, usually 16 years old, the community as a whole regularly hold one year at, at a time, they would have a debutant uh, party or ball. Uh, people that are wealthy and uh, having a young girl to be introduced to the world so that other uh, suitable bachelors would be made aware of this beautiful young woman so that they could try to pursue her. And such kind of party is, is this kind of a debut for young girls and the world that young girl is being called a debutante. And uh, you can see some TV programs specifically dedicated to such kind of parties. And uh, the wealthy father could shell out, oh, that's another word for shell, and come back to that word. The father could shell out a million dollars to hold this party or to attend this party so that uh, he would be able to attract the attention of some other eligible bachelors. Uh, let's come back to the word shell. To shell out means to, to take out a, a significant amount of money, to spend that money on something, which uh, would put a dent on your, a significant dent on your, your bank account. But because of this, of the, the amount is so much, they use the word shell to describe this uh, action because it's almost like launching a, a cannonball. It would so damage your financial situation. Uh, here's the word squat, which means to, to lower yourself, but not to sit down on the chair and not to sit on the floor. So you just bend your knees and you become much lower. That is to squat. And this word was used to describe poor people having no home of their own, and they just uh, decided to sneak in and uh, stay at other people's place, either a house or a piece of land, without per permission. So these people are called squatters, and this action is the verb to describe this action is squat. And it's almost always about people who could not afford to buy or rent their own place. And this is when we were talking about Walsing Matilda in Australia. There were squatters in the 19th century who don't own the land, they just go from place to places and uh, pitch a tent next to the river bend and uh, do chores and earn a living. Uh, this uh, in Chinese dictionary, it says, shan zi zhan di zhe. When I was little, we had wei zhang jian zhu, uh, which means there are lots of people fleeing mainland China who could not afford to rent or own a house. So they just, uh, <laughs> you can say pitch a, a tent, but not, not even a tent. They just put down their own things 
and use that land or that piece of property as their own, which was a serious uh, social problem. Which means construction without uh, city approval. Squatting is the action uh, about occupying an abandoned or unoccupied area of land or a building, usually residential, uh, that the squatters does not, the squatter does not own uh, rent or otherwise have lawful permission to use. Uh, so this word is called the squatting and these people are called the squatters. And this is a worldwide problem. So the United Nations, which is Lian uh, Guo, they did some kind of research and they say there are over 1 billion slum residents and squatters globally. Isn't that a very large number of people? Because uh, I think the world, the entire population of the world does not exceed 10 billion. So more than 10% of the people in the world don't own, don't have legal possession of the place they are residing. That is a big problem. And especially in developing countries uh, and the least developed countries. However, we, we see that every day nowadays when I drive around in the city of Seattle, we have a lot more squatters here and there near the bank or uh, I mean near the, the park in the in the bank. <laughs> I'm sorry, I keep saying bank in the parks or by some churches or some community centers. It, it's a very serious problem. We call it homeless problem, but it's the same thing as Wei Zhang Jianchu or squatters. Uh, uh, rarely, but uh, still, there are a lot of squatters who were protesting uh, for, for political reason. It can be anarchist, which means uh, they are against any kind of uh, government. So they could be squatting uh, doing some kind of protest, but they are not, they, they may go home to sleep in their own homes, but they go to a place to protest. Autonomous, uh, which means uh, a group of people who wants to establish their own government, not be part of the existing government. They want to be autom autonomous. Uh, or a socialist, uh, which means uh, 社会主义者, huh? and The last word of the, on this list is malaria, which in Chinese we call it 虐疾胀气, or 打白子, huh? When I was little, we used to call it 打白子, which is much more a, a comma, uh, not, not official word for it because nye qi is a more academic word. And uh, before the scientific reality was revealed to people, uh, the word for it is called the zhang qi, because people don't know why people get nye qi or da bai zi. They call it zhang qi because in this area that is hot and muggy and swampy, and there are lots of uh, mosquitoes, and it seems that just by being in that area, you would get this disease. So people blame the, 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 the dirty air that is hot and smelly to be the reason for this kind of disease, not knowing that it was uh, carried around by the mosquitoes. And now we know, and we also know that only female mosquitoes, when they're pregnant, when they're about to lay eggs, they want suck blood from people or other animals. Uh, so it, you're safe around male mosquitoes, but of course you couldn't tell the difference. The malaria is a 
mosquito-borne disease. And this, <laughs> when I do this slide, I think about our current pandemic all the time because there are so many similar words used when you describe malaria. Infectious uh, affects human and other animals. And the symptoms, uh, symptoms means the when you have a certain disease, how can you tell you, you have this? How can the doctor tell? Or how can you describe your situation to tell your doctor? So that's called symptoms. The symptoms are typically uh, in, involved in this, all, all these things, such as a fever, tiredness, vomiting, that is to throw up, uh, barfing, B-A-R-F, um, and headaches. Uh, these are the common symptoms of uh, malaria. Uh, when it's very severe, you can have seizures or you can even go into a coma or you can die. So it is quite serious sometimes. And sometimes if you had it and it was not serious, then and a few months down the road, when you get it again, then your symptoms would not be so severe. But if it goes on a long time without your having this disease, then your advantage would decrease. You could get a serious uh, malaria if you have not had it for a long, long time. Uh, and the people die, uh, many, many people die in the world. So this is a very, very serious threat to the human race, especially in the poor country, in the hot tropical or subtropical areas uh, who could not afford uh, screens on the windows or a mosquito net over their beds. It is not too expensive, but if you can not afford it, then you could lose your life. And this, in the eye of people like Bill Gates, it is grossly in, <laughs> unjust for people to die just because they could not afford to pay a few dollars for a mosquito net. So if you want to do good, to the world that this is one area that you can really, you, your money can go a long time saving people's life. And that is one of the biggest things that Bill Gates decided to focus on. If not, okay. Uh, so I just mentioned, if you try not to get bitten by a mosquito, then you are safe. So the, the way to prevent getting malaria is to prevent yourself from being bitten by mosquitoes. And you can use mosquito nets or you can spray insect repellents. We, do, we did that all the time when we were young. Or with the mosquito control measures such as spraying insecticide and draining the swamp. Yeah, when I was little, that was a very common disease. And uh, pretty soon enough, we managed, I mean, in Taiwan, we managed to defeat the disease and we declared the Taiwan as malaria free. And uh, since then, there are lots of countries who managed to do the same thing. And it was very heartening to see such things happen. However, there are still way too many people who are infected every year and who even die because of that. Uh, there were 220 million cases of malaria worldwide in 2019. That is still a lot of people. And they cost about 400,000 deaths a year. Wow. And when I traveled to the, such countries, I would uh, 
check the CDC website to see what kind of malaria, what kind of medication or preventive medication you can take. And uh, I've had many different kinds of medication be because the CDC advised me to do different way. I don't know why. There must be some different kinds of malaria and uh, the availability of the medication and so on. So I think I had uh, doxycycline and I had uh, malarone and things like that. Yeah, it's quite common. However, when I got it from uh, Room Health, it cost me like $150 for a certain number of pills. Usually last time was 43 pills because you have to start taking one a day, seven days before you arrive and maybe seven days after and so on. So these are all the things you have to do, but many people who live there, they don't do it. Like when I arrived in South Africa, on the second day, our tour guide appeared and said she was diagnosed with malaria. And from then on, we will have a new tour guide. So we all asked her, we each of us are taking some kind of malaria pills. How come you're not doing it? She said, you can do, you cannot do it when you live there because then you have to take it every day for years and years and years. That's not good for your body. So we don't take it. Okay, so that's life. 94% of, the, of these kind of disease occurred in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Sahara is the great desert in Africa. And uh, the area below it, when you look at the map with the north side up, sub-Saharan Africa is the area right underneath Sahara Desert. And 94% of the malaria cases in the world happen in that area. So when I went there, I was advised to take, that, that, that's why I took the malarone pills. However, when we, I got there, I was there for 35 days and I only got seven mosquito bites. So we said, you have less mosquitoes in sub-Saharan Africa than in many other places. For example, when I went to Peru with my brother and he counted on his back 150 mosquito bites. So you're quite safe when you're in sub-Saharan Africa. We said, how come? And they said, Bill Gates killed all the mosquitoes in our country. Okay, uh, right now there's a vaccine that's been approved since 2015, but it's not uh, popular or it's not common. It's like what we're getting the vaccine for. Uh, only a small percentage of people, they're still in the trial stage. That's, that's why, okay. Once it's, it passes the trial stages, then you can, or Bill Gates can launch mass vaccination in the, in those targeted areas. And then they will be able to eradicate, uh, the word is called eradicate. Eradicate is to xiao mie or the xiao chu, this kind of infectious disease. Uh, in 2015, WHO targeted a 90% reduction in malaria death by 2030. Uh, so from 2015 to 2030, WHO, which is World Health Organization, they have a goal of reducing the cases, case number, or the death, case, death cases from malaria by 90%. That is quite significant. And uh, in 2016, Bill Gates said that he thought global eradication would be possible by 2040. Of course, they had an earlier goal before, but then by that time, 2016, they have extended that deadline. 
their goal is now 2040. Okay, let's sing some songs now. This song, as I mentioned, is about an epic figure, David Crockett. He has a very illustrious, illustrious life, uh, full of adventures. So you need to have a very long song to tell his story. So I chose this full length version of this song, which has 21 verses. Each verse is a duan luoha in a song or in a, a poem. We usually use the word stanza, which is a formal word for verses. Verses is a much common, more common word. And that means one section in a song or in a poem. However, if you go to YouTube, and I hope you would, you will be able to find many, many more. Uh, let, me, let me do the change while I talk. I, it looks like I simply cannot speak and do. <laughs> I just can't do, do multitasking. <laughs> let me see if I can do it. Okay, we got it. Okay, so if you go to YouTube, there are many, many other versions of this song, but most of them have only four or five verses, but this one has 21. So it's uh, the, the real thing. It's, it's got... <laughs> What is so strange? It's broken up, like oh. shaky. Mm, well, I being not a tech savvy person, I can only stop it and launch it again. <laughs> Maybe it's too loud. Is it too loud? Because... No, it's not. It's like a bing, 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 bing. Oh, okay. Now, if I download it, I'll be able to play it smoothly. However, I already deleted my software, the app, and I could no longer get it because they were sued by many uh, companies like Sony or whatever. Mm -hmm. So uh, le let's just try again. Mm -hmm. Let me do a stop share and then I do a share and I try this again. Share. Maybe it's only me. Uh, we might as well just stop it because uh, you all have the link and you can watch it and it's way too long for you to go sit through the whole thing. So we just uh, skip it. Uh, let's go back and we'll read it, uh, read the lyrics. Uh, okay. So this is Fred Waring and his Pennsylvanians. Uh, his chorus group is called the Pennsylvanians. And he was the only one who posted uh, this, this song on YouTube with all the 21 verses. And uh, it goes like this and uh, it's really, really long. Music by George Burns, lyrics by Thomas Blackburn. Uh, the first verse is not part of the main song. It's, it's just a few uh, fancy lines put together. So people s tell you this is a story about David Cro Crockett. He's the king of the wild frontier. He's a man who don't know fear. Huh? Here we say don't because this is a 
song for regular people who are uneducated. So they don't know how to say doesn't know fear. So they say who don't know fear. Uh, the buckskin pioneer. The buckskin means a deer. Buck is a male deer. So buckskin means you take the uh, skin of a deer and use it to make things such as a jacket or a knife uh, so handle or things like that. Okay, He's the pioneer who is a person who goes to a place where other people haven't been to. Uh, that's called the pioneer. And he's called a buckskin pioneer because he's always wearing uh, clothing made of uh, deer skin, even when he's in formal occasion and uh, other people are all wearing suits, he prefers to wear buckskin shirt, okay, or jacket. King of the Wild Frontier. All these things were names given to him by admiring people. They think he's so great. So all these things were mentioned at the end of each uh, stanza of the following song, but they took it all out and put them in the front. Then they start to sing the song. Born on the mountaintop in Tennessee, greenest estate in the land of the free. Huh? And of course, you can see there are all five lines in each stanza, and they try to uh, rhyme, but not always successful. Like this, this one ends in frontier, while everything else ended in e. Okay. But I don't even want to explain line by line because the most of them are simple sentences and did not really tell you much it's just heaping praises of over this legendary person that they admire have you ever heard of david crockett before have you ever seen john wayne's movie or for that matter any other movie uh, about him uh, i personally i've seen quite a few and uh, the one that's stuck on, in my mind is a John Wayne's movie because uh, I've watched it many times. And the lines, uh, the story, uh, you just come away with the adoration. You love this person. He's so great and he does everything uh, so wonderfully well. And uh, at the end, he uh, sacrificed his own life and many of his fellow uh, soldiers who had this idealistic uh, uh, philosophy about government and they want to fight the oppressive government and they all died. Every one of them died except for uh, uh, one widow and a young child at, at the end that they walk on this stage and you could see everyone else died. But all these you saw in the movie were fake. There is not a shred of truth in that movie. I'm so disappointed. Okay, let's go on. <laughs> in 1813, the Creeks uprose. The Creeks is a kind of Indian, American Indian tribe. And nowadays we call them a Native American or indigenous American people. Anyway, because people look down upon the locals, so no matter how you call them, that word is derogatory. So they had to change the name again and again. So Creeks is the tribe's name, but now you cannot say they're Indians. You cannot say they're American Indians. You usually say they're Native Americans right now. So Creek is a tribe who used to live here before the white men came. Adding rescue arrows to the country's woe. I put the red skin somewhere else, you know? Ring me, okay. Uh, let's go back. 
So fighting Indians was one thing that became the UN, United States wars, okay? Uh, now, injured, injured was another word. If you go to Mark Twain's book, I'm sure he would have called them Injuns. Injun Joe, actually, one of the characters in Huckleberry Finn was called Injun Joe. So Injun is uh, just a corruption of the word Indian, uh, which is kind of uh, derogatory, like calling Japanese Jap. It's, so it sounds derogatory, okay? Indian fighting is something he knows. And so he's familiar with this kind of work to fight Indian people in America. So he shouldered his rifle and off he goes. And so this is a starting in the early time when he was not married. He was not a congressman. He was not anything. So he just went out and uh, fought the Indians. He was a man who don't know fear. Up through the woods, he's um, marching along, making up yarns and uh, singing a song. Huh? Here we say making up yarns. Yarn is a, a piece of thread, mao xian. Huh? So you you make up yarns. It means that in training, you brag about stories you, you experience, but it's not true. For example, you went to you went fishing and people say, oh, how many fish did you catch? You would say, uh, three. And the next they say, how many? You would say five. And every time somebody asks you something, you would exaggerate it a little bit, or you tell a story differently. That's called the making up yarns and the singing a song. Itching for fighting and the writing a rock. Of course, when they say David Crockett, they just mean that he is fantastic in telling you great stories. They did not mean that he was lying, okay? Uh, he was writing a wrong. Huh? He saw something wrong and he tries to write it. That's, that's called writing a wrong. So he said, uh, okay? Uh, his ringy as a bear, and twice as strong. Huh? The word ringy is a word we've never seen before. It is a slang word for everything good and nothing bad, a catch-all phrase for spreading positive positivity, uh, to tell things in a positive way. Now, then you say, he is ringy. That means he is so right. He's always right. He's so good. Uh, and as, as twice as strong as a bear, huh? Uh, twice, just a, twice, huh? 比一个熊还要壮, 加一倍的强壮,就是他所说的 bear and twigged as strong, huh? These are all spats. David, David Crockett, the buccaneer. Buccaneer is kind, some kind of bandit or pirate or Huh? who rob people, but uh, it's in a good way, okay? It's very handsome and sm smashingly uh, strong and uh, capable. Uh, here we have Andy Jackson. I said I was going to show you Andy Jackson. I don't know if you can see it. I cannot see myself, so I don't know if you can see this in front of me, it does, it's a $20 bill and you should be able to have one in your wallet, okay? Andy Jackson is a person on this $20 bill and he, nowadays he's so notorious that they wanna kick him off the $20 bill. He was a president of United States and he ordered the mass killing of the Indian people. And nowadays, uh, people don't want to praise him too much if you're politically correct. Of course, there are people who still love him. Uh, Andy Jackson is our general's name. His regular soldiers will put to shame. Ah, this story says, Davy Crocker led a band of people to fight and they're so good at fighting. 
he, uh, they would put Andy Jackson's regular soldiers to shame. 就是说 the United States Army was no comparison when they compared to the compare their work to Davy Crocker's work, work doing the same thing. Now this is what we say: put to shame. He puts Andy Jackson's regular soldiers to shame. Uh, then Redskin environments. Uh, this is a very directive. This song was written in 1953, and at that time, Redskin was a common word for people to address Indian American Indians, and in a directive way. And there was a baseball team called the Redskin, and now they no longer is called. The, the the team is no longer called the red skin because it's not politically correct. Huh? In this song, it says the red skin, the red skin varmints. Huh? This kind of song would never survive nowadays because we cannot call them red skin varmints.、Uh, last time I met, mentioned the word var varmints, it means those pests or or bad animals like locust or. Uh, rats or any any kind of animal that is a, a nuisance, we could call it a varmint. So we don't call it,、uh, American Indian varmints anymore.、Uh, us means we、uh, mean people of、uh, David Crockett. They are the volunteers. They are not the regular soldiers of Andy Jackson. They would.、Uh, Tame the red skin varmints.、Uh, so they fought the in American Indians with great success. Which means this what this is what he means by tame the red skin varmints. Because we got the guns with the surefire aim. David David Crockett, the champion of us all.、Uh, the next verse headed back to war from the old home place. Okay, so after that, headed to war, but Red Stick was leading a merry chase.、Oh, okay, Red Stick is okay. Red Stick also means the American Creeks because they paint their skin. They are war clubs, huh? They carry a big club, 一个大的棍子，像棒球棍那样 and it was painted red. So we call this kind of tribe Red Stick, huh? These are all derogatory words. Uh, Red Stick was leading a merry chase,、uh, so he was going home, and the、uh, Indians were chasing after them, fighting and burning at Devil's Pace.、Uh, that means、uh, very quickly、uh, at Devil's Pace, they they were fighting and burning south to the swamps in the Florida Trace. Okay, tracking the. So he was fighting the Indians in Florida. Fought single-handed through the Indian War.、Uh, I wouldn't say he was single-handed. He has a group of volunteers. So this is really—you、uh, have to take the story, the lyrics of this song in the, with a grain of salt.、Huh? Fought single-handedly through the Indian War, till the Creeks was whipped.、Uh, you you could argue that it should say war, not was, but. You don't. You put your grammar book away when you're singing this song. Whipped and the peas. Okay, the creeks was whipped. Were whipped. Whipped, 就是被打的很惨的意思啊。We say whipped cream or whipped something. 哈，用鞭子抽的很厉害，叫做 whip. And、uh, the creeks were whipped. 就被打败了哈。And the peace was restored. 所以世界上，呃 ，peace. Came back into the world, and while he was handling this risky chore, made himself a legend forevermore.、Uh, so he became very famous for fighting Indians. On the other hand, this this song says that he kept his words. He made peace with Indians. And they agreed on certain terms, and he always kept his words. Okay. 
He gives his word and he gives his hand. That means he reached out with his hand as a friend. Uh, so they agreed that the Indian friends could keep their land. And the rest of his life, he took this. He took the stand that justice was due every rescuing then. So throughout his life, he always kept his word that Indians could keep their land. So he's a fair person. That's what this story, this song is about. Huh? Holding his promise dear. Home for the winter with his family, happy as a squirrel in the old gum tree. So by the time he's uh, married and have kids, being the father, he wanted to be, uh, he was very happy to be home and to be close to his sons, close to his boys as the pot and the pea. Uh, we say that, I wonder if you have ever eaten fresh peas in the pod. We like to eat snow pea, but those are not ripened or mature peas in the pod. Uh, the casing is called a pod. Uh, a P-O-D is a word for the pea pod. And it, you can also use the word for other things that are together. For example, we here in uh, San Juan Island, we have our resident orca pods. A group of orca whales sticking together, forming a society, is called a pod. And uh, we do ex extended, extensive research on all these pods of uh, orcas, and uh, we know where, how many, what their organization, and uh, where they go from, uh, from time to time. So that is a pod of orca whales. And for a pea, this is a pod with identical looking peas inside. So you often think that this is a family with a, your brothers and sisters are just identical people staying together inside a pea pod. And in this uh, lyric, it says, he is close to his boys as the pod and the pea. So he's the pod and his boys are the peas. Holding his young ones dear. Huh? Here we have U-N-S, which means O-N-E-S, uh, young ones, young ones. It's also a corruption of uh, uh, the speak, speaking language. So he went home and throughout the winter he stayed home, but when spring comes and the ice started to melt, he was itching to do something else. The ice went, went out and the warm winds came and the melting snow showed tracks of game. So you could see that uh, there were animals in the area with tracks. Tracks means in the area. Of course, we can say uh, railroad tracks, that is the railroad tracks. A track is something that's on the ground and left behind by something. And the flowers of spring fill the woods with flame. Uh, the forest was like on fire. And all of a sudden life got too tame. So he didn't, did not want to stay home with the kids. So he's heading on west again. Off through the woods, we're riding along. I, sometimes he says we, and sometimes he says he, and sometimes is <laughs> he's just telling the same story. Making up yarn is again huh? what he does, and the singing a song. His ring is a. It's, we have seen this before. Looking for a place where the air smells clean, where the trees is tall. Of course, you know, it's trees are tall, not is. And the grass is green, where the fish is fed in an untouched stream. And the teeming woods. Now, teeming means the woods is full of living things like trees or bushes or animals. 
It's teeming means full of life. Huh? It's the hunter's dream. So he's looking for paradise. Now he's lost his love. Huh? So he got married and had kids, but then his wife died. Huh? I have a note here. His first wife, Polly Fidley, married 1806 to 1815. That's when she died. And immediately in the same year, he married a second wife. Huh? So he wanted to leave it all and lose himself in the forest tall, but he answered instead to his country's call. He wanted to do something more adventurous, but then at that time, the country called him. What did the country call him for? They, people around him wanted to become a congressman because he's getting famous and was a very capable person. So he started to campaign to become a congressman, I mean, to become a, re a member of the representative in the House of Representatives. Needing his help, they didn't vote blind. Huh? This is telling you about the people in his district. They needed his help. They did, did not go vote for him blindly because they knew he was able to help them. They put in Davy because he was their kind, because uh, he's a, their kind of person. And they, first they sent him to Nashville. Nashville is probably the capital of Tennessee. So that's the best person the people could find, a fighting spirit and a thinking mind. Uh, so he went, they sent him to Nashville, which means he became a legislator in the state Senate or in the state uh, legislature. There's an upper legislature and the lower legislature, and the upper one is, is called the Senate. But you have to say state Senate because they are not senators in Washington, D.C. So his first state is to go to his state capital to become a legislator. But later on, when he did well, he was sent instead to Washington, D.C. to represent his own state, his own district in the state. Um, there are many. I could not keep track of it. There are the legis the members, the number of uh, members of the legislative branch in the country uh, is uh, based on the population. So every 10 years you have a uh, census, Huko Pucha. Huh? After the census, you know exactly the number of the people in each area. Then new congressmen were allocated for each district. Uh, so once when I started noticing there were 400 congressmen, then later there were 450. So the number keeps growing up, going up, okay. The votes were counted and he won hands down. So he won the race. So they sent him off to Washington town with his best dress suit still his buckskins brown. So he's still wearing his deer skin suit, but he is now a legislator in Washington, a living legend of growing renown and getting more famous. Huh? Uh, the last line says he is the canebrake congressman, the hero of the land. What is a canebrake? A canebrake is like this. Long, tall grass, strong and very hard to break. And they are the kind that grows in Southwest of US. They're not just one kind, they're quite several different kinds, either on the coast or by the river or in the valley, or it can be from any other places that, that are wild and a strong grass. It's called cane break. And the, the lyricists use this word to describe David Crockett. 
he went up to Congress and served a spell, which means it's a not one, not not long one. A, a term for congressman is two years. So every two years, you have to run for re-election. And just about every time you won, you are campaigning for your next one because the cycle is so frequent. So he went there to serve a spell and he did not stay there long, okay? Fixing up the government and the laws as well. You've uh, he would fix up the government and he would fix up the law. Took over Washington. So we heard tell. We hear people say, uh, here we have the word H-E-E-R-E-D, which is a wrong word. It doesn't exist. It should be spelled as H-E-A-R-D. Uh, we heard people say that he took over Washington. He was very famous and well-known and did a lot of things there. And the patched up the crack in the Liberty Bell. I bet some of you have been to Pennsylvania, uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where there is on display a Liberty Bell. It's a big bell that was cast when the country was newly established. They got this bell from Europe uh, to ring the liberty sound, sound of the liberty bell. However, this bell cracked. There you go now, and you can see the bell is still cracked. And in this stanza, he says he fixed the government, he fixed the laws, and he even patched up the crack in the bell, but which certainly he did not. Okay. Him and his jokes traveled all through the land. He certainly is a person who could tell jokes in his figure by now. And he made him friends to beat the band. Huh? I have a note down there explaining what it means to beat the band. To a huge or the greatest possible extent or degree, very briskly, very fast. Uh, this line says he made a lot of friends very quickly. That's what it means. His politicking was hit, was their favorite brand. So he his kind of politics is what people like. Like it's their favorite brand, and everyone wanted to shake his hand. So his legend grows, helping his legend grow. He knew when he spoke, he sounded the. No. So something he said made people afraid, thinking something bad would happen. Huh? Now means death now. When somebody dies, the church would ring a death, a, a, a now, ring the church now, which means announcing the, the death of a person. He said something that was very uh, uh, when people hear, they were alarmed, they were warned, and they didn't. They were not happy of his hope. Uh, he he tell things of his hopes, and this, this and that, including those warnings. But he spoke out very strongly, so the history books tell. And the pet. this is saying why our hero did not stay there and be congressman year after year because he was voted out. In the beginning, the lyric says, he's their kind of man and they all voted him and they needed him and so on and so forth, but he was voted out later, okay? When he come home, his politicking done, the Western March had just begun. Uh, by that time, the, the great march westward happened. The people on the East Coast would uh, travel to the West because there are more space, more free land and lots of opportunity. So he, he went West along with others. He packed his gear and his trusty gun. Now, gear is a, a combination of all kinds of things that you need. So when you travel, you take your gear with you, which means all the things you need on the road. 
and let out the breathing to follow the sun. Okay, 他就咧只牙齿一样笑哈。我们说 light out a grin. A grin 就是露出牙齿的笑。Uh, this is to describe the way he went west to follow the sun. I wonder why you follow the sun by going west. Oh, I see. So you, the sun comes in the east. So he followed the sun to the west. Okay, that's good. You heard of Houston and Austin? These are the two famous people in Texas. We had、uh, Sam Houston, and also the name of the. A city, probably their biggest city, and the name of the airport. Oh, actually, the name of the airport is now I A H. So it's yeah, it's the airport in Houston, but it's George Bush Airport, I think. Anyway, that's where the word Houston comes from, and the capital of Texas is Austin. And this Austin is another famous person. So these two people、uh, figured very significantly in the saga of Alamo, the Alamo.、Uh, David Crockett went to the、uh, Alamo and died there, and he was there because he heard of Houston and Austin, and their call for people to join the. Independence War, or the rebellion, or the protest against the Mexican government. So he heard these two people who tell all heroes everywhere to go to Texas to rebel. So he had to go. Freedom was、uh, where freedom was fighting another foe.、Huh? They had the big enemy, who was Santa Ana of of Mexico, and they needed him at the Alamo. That's why he went. Huh? So let's briefly say that he went to the Alamo because he wants to fight for freedom,、uh, for Houston, for Austin, against Santa Ana, and against Mexico. But why? You would wonder why. When you watch the movie. Yes, it tells the same thing. He's there to fight for freedom. Now comes the very last one. We don't know. All of a sudden, the story came to an end with no detail whatsoever. His land is biggest and his land is best. From grassy plains to the mountain crest, is ahead of us all meeting the test. He's ahead of us all. Meeting the test, which means he died there, following his legend into the West. Davy Crockett, king of the wild frontier. Okay, here we have a picture of Davy Crockett. Oh, good-looking enough person. He was born in 1786, and he died in 1836 in the Battle of the Alamo. And of all the books and movies we have seen、uh, until 2010, they all say he died in the war. But in the mo- the later version of the movie, they corrected to say that he was captured and the trial and beheaded by the Mexicans. You wonder, I. Kept saying why the Mexican because Texas was part of Mexico. Mexico. He wants to go with Houston and the Dallas. I mean Austin, not the Dallas. Austin. Okay, Dallas is another city. We're not talking about Dallas. So he followed Houston and Austin because. These American people who lived in Mexico in Texas wanted to set the state free. They want to be away from Mexico, and Mexico was their boss, the president of their country. But they were rebellious, and they want to rebel against them. And they claim that 
they want to be free. What kind of freedom? Uh, they want their property to stay belonging to them. Uh, what property then? They're slaves. They are all slave owners with lots of slaves, black slave working for them with no wage. And uh, Mexico as the bigger government above them wanted to abolish slavery. They don't think people should own slaves. And these white Americans wanted to keep on owning slaves. That's why they want the so-called freedom. Their freedoms is to keep owning slaves despite the laws of the country. At that time, America still allowed slavery and uh, they were free to own slaves until 1864 or 65. I say 64 is when Lincoln pronounced uh, the emancipation of slaves. But after the war, they, be, they won the war. So the South must have followed the, the North and abolish slavery. However, we could see that the, the remnant of slavery still goes on for many, many more years. But the key here is that Texas and part of uh, Alabama, California, Arizona, we have a map to show you. That part belonged to Spain. And after Spain was gone, Mexico, though those places became Mexican. And these American diaspora who, who live there did not want to follow the law to get rid of their slaves, okay? So that's a gist of the story that all the people were hiding from regular people. You hear all these freedom fighters, they were fighting for their slavery activities. Uh, he was a House of Representatives and served in the, the so-called, this war is called the Texas Revolution. In the end, they succeeded, even though at this stage in 1836, they lost the Alamo. Okay, at first I talk a little bit about epic. Uh, it's a very long and narrative poem. Narrative means uh, to tell a story. So it's not about the oh, beautiful story, uh, scenery or about my love for the girl or whatever. It is a story of a, a, a person. Huh? An epic has to be a story about the person's life in great detail. And using the words that are high and mighty, elevated and dignified language. Celebrating the feats of a deity, mostly a deity, even when it's a real person, it's with exaggeration and fake news. Uh, a story about many gods or demigods, heroic, epic, legend or traditional heroes. So this one is certainly an epic story about David Crocker. <clears throat> However, epic did not born yesterday. Uh, it was, has a very long history. Uh, here we have a list of famous examples of epic poetry. The first one in all the world was written sometime to about 4,000 years ago uh, by the Sumerian people, Sumerian, huh? and it's called the Epic of Gilgamesh. And uh, of course, there are others after that. And the most, the longest of them all was the Mahabharata, which was written in India in, from uh, between third century BC and the third century AD. And it comes, contains 1.8 million words, you can tell. That was the longest thing ever written in the world. And there was another epic called Ramayana, but it's far shorter than 1.8 million words. 
And in Persia, which we call Iran, uh, Persia, there was a famous epic poet, poem called the Shamnamed. And in Greek, because uh, Western culture is so prevalent, most people have heard of Greek epics such as Odyssey and Iliad. But Homer is himself a legend. Whether he existed or not is in question. He could be a combination, a composite of different people. Uh, we, we don't know. So Homer himself is a legend. Uh, Virgil's uh, Aeneid, uh, this is about another hero. Uh, Odyssey and Iliad are both about heroes in the Trojan War. Uh, Odyssey is about Odysseus. After the war, he went home, and which took him like 10 or 20 years to get home, even though it's not too far away. And uh, Iliad is uh, about the war itself, mostly about uh, uh, Achilles and uh, Hector. Okay, Hector. So these are all about great heroes. Some are half, like Achilles is half god, half human. So these are all people who may not be as great as they describe. And uh, Aeneas is another hero of that Trojan War. Uh, after the war, he went south into the Aegean Sea and eventually went to Rome and established the city of Rome. So these are all stories about uh, some very great heroes who had accomplished a lot. And, a much more recent and in shorter stories, you have uh, the English poetry uh, called the Beowulf and the Dante's Divine Comedy, just Dan Ding the Shen Chu, and the German story about the gods, uh, Nibelungen Lied. Uh, this is uh, the song of Nibelung. Uh, it's called the Nibelungen uh, uh, Lied, uh, is the song. The French story is called The Song of Roland. The uh, Spanish story, Canta de Mio Cid, is a story about El Cid. Uh, this is like 12th century, around the time of uh, the Crusaders, but it's in Spain. And Milton's uh, Paradise Lost is much, much later. This is uh, during Elizabethan time. Uh, daughter of uh, King A J Henry the Eighth, King of England. Okay, so these are all the famous and really, really famous ones. Uh, I deleted several that are not as famous because the list was too long. So when you look at them, you you can almost see that every great country or civilization has this kind of story, sometimes more than one, and they tell in great detail and admiration about a hero uh, of their forefather or something that happened in the past. Uh, so this one is for America, uh, an epic about a person who actually lived here in this country. So this is a very long story. And uh, for some reason, even though this person was famous for a while, uh, it, his story really took off in 1954 when all these people, foremost among them Disneyland, Disney, uh, Walt Disney, he was the one who put David Crockett on the modern histories. Uh, I say radar on the radar of everybody because before him probably he was David Crockett was not as famous or not as admired but after the TV series about David Crockett which is a series with a five episode with the David Crockett played by 
Fess Parker. And it became such a great hit that everyone wanted to watch it and watched it and want to dress up like David Crockett and want to sing the song and all sorts of things. The fact that you can find so many versions of this song on YouTube that are not the full length, it's because there are many people who could only remember three verses and they still want to sing this song. So they learn the much shorter version of it because there's just way too many who loved him. And it took Disney by surprise. They did not know such a TV story could have such a huge popularity. And they really took advantage of this popularity. And they sold the movie rights and they sold the everything that's connected movie, including this coon skin hat. I'll show you a picture of that. Okay, and this song was made into a recording many, many times, even in 1968 by Louis Armstrong. So many people made a recording of his song. And it was on, the, on ABC from 1954 to 55. And there were five episodes made into two feature length theater movies. And this is Fess Park Parker, Face Parker. Uh, he was wearing this buckskin suit where everyone else was not. And this is when it, this movie became, uh, this TV series became a movie. And this is a poster. All these has a, uh, the actor's name here, Fess Parker, okay? It's the same people. Okay, here is the coon, coon hat. Okay, coon with a tail, coon skin cap. Uh, you probably have seen this hat. And in 1954 or 55, everyone was wearing it. And they made a bundle selling this kind of things, here's the word, paraphernalia. Huh? Anything that goes along with the bigger theme is a paraphernalia. Uh, so you have this coonskin hat, cap that is derived from this TV series or a bubblegum card. These things are all things that's attached to a main story. That's called the paraphernalia. Uh, okay, and then this is also a great hit, a very great hit, a movie by John Wayne. It was in 1960. So after those TV and the movies were done, John Wayne decided to a project, do a project himself. He himself produced this whole thing, and he played David Crocker. It is entirely about this 1836 event of the Battle of the Alamo. And there are other people, famous names attached to this project, like Richard Winmark and Lawrence Harvey. And there was a remake, as I mentioned, that did some kind of a correction. So when we talk about the historical movie, we would very much like to know whether it's historically accurate, how much is true and how much is not, and what are not historically accurate. Uh, the film does little to explain the causes of Texas revolution or why the battle took place. So if you watch the movie, you just know that John Wayne kept saying, we want freedom. We want to get away from Santa Ana, but it didn't say why. It didn't say why they are controlling your life because you are a citizen of their country. Uh, Alamo historian Timothy Toddish claims that there is not a single scene in the Alamo which corresponds to a historically verifiable incident. So this whole movie 
was full of lies. There's not a single thing in it that is correct. Historian James Frank Doby and the Long Tinkle demanded their names be removed as historical advisors. But when you make a movie, you often want to hire some big names as expert uh, advisors. And of course, they did that for this movie. And after the movies were made, these two advisors demanded their names be removed as historical advisors. Uh, John Wayne's daughter, Asa, wrote this. He said, she said, I think making the Alamo became my father's own form of combat. He took this project as his big fight. More than an obsession, it was the most intensely personal project in his career. So this is his biggest project. It's more than an obsession. He wanted to do this. For what? Because he wants people to know he is against the communists. He used this story to tell people that People like Santa Ana, who's the president, I'm not quite sure it's the president or the whatever, maybe he has a different name, a post, his position. People like Santa Ana, who's the leader of a country that owned Texas, California, and so on and so forth. John Wayne is comparing him to Stalin and Hitler. That's why he's so feverishly pursuing this project. He wants people to know that the communists are bad and they, are as, they including Stalin, are as bad as Hitler and as bad as Santa Ana. Okay, that's the whole story. In a major scene, John Wayne, as David Crockett remarked, uh, this is a quote, I remember distinctly how and when he said this, this part of the, the script, he says, Republic, which means this country, he wants the country to be a Republic. So he thinks Santa Ana was a, a illegitimate leader, ruler of Mexico, because he's a dictator. It is uh, more or less agreed that he's kind of a dictator, but that doesn't mean anyone who's against this dictator is a freedom fighter. He could be a slave owner wanting to keep slaves. And John Wayne said in the movie, Republic, I like the sound of the word. It means that people can live free, talk free, go or come, buy or sell, be drunk or sober, however they choose. Some words give you a feeling. Republic is one of those words that makes me tight in the throat. Uh, tight in the throat is when you say that you feel the throat is tightening up. You are so emotional. Your throat tightens. Uh, another word is... Uh, uh, somewhere in the front, I was going to talk. There's a sober, huh? Drunk or sober? Drunk is to be drunk after drinking a lot of alcoholic drinks. And a sober means you are not drunk. You are clear minded. You did not drink a lot and you still can make decisions or do things right. Huh? So a person can be drunk or sober. Uh, or do whatever they choose. That's the freedom I'm trying to give to my people. And when I think of the word republic, it makes my throat tight. Uh, this is a very moving uh, script. And in this uh, movie, if you watch it, he actually, not, not word for word, word uh, saying, these people are like Stalin and uh, Khrushchev and uh, uh, Santa Anna. But he is saying, think about your own life. 
your friend, your country who's fighting against the communist. That's what we are doing when we were in Texas. Okay. And this is a remake. Uh, there are many remakes, but some are more famous than others. Uh, this one uh, has many famous names attached to it. It was in the year 2004. It's also a Disney movie about the same story. And it's got Dennis Quaid as Sam Houston and uh, Billy Bob Thornton, who was the a prior husband of Angelina Jolie as David Crockett and uh, Jason Patrick as Jim Bowie and the Patrick Wilson as William Travis. Okay, these are all the characters in the story and some quite famous names. So we were talking about the historical accuracy of this next movie that's called The Alamo again. Uh, the depiction, huh? that means that the story part in this movie about David Crockett's fate, the depiction of it came from memoirs written by Jose Enrique de la Pena, Pena, an officer in Santa Ana's army. So there is a soldier, an army, an army officer in Santa Ana's army who wrote uh, a diary. So in his diary, he stated that David Crockett was captured and executed. Well, the American people think that is a, not a good ending for a hero. So they always insisted that uh, he died in the battle or he uh, caused the battle to make everybody die because they did not want to survive. So apparently he did not die and he was captured. Being captured means that he surrendered and was caught by the Mexican people. So that this deniers don't want to admit to that. Uh, of course, that is just one person writing in his own diary, but there's no reason to doubt that it's not truthful. And after many, many researchers, most historians agree now that he probably died by execution as a prisoner of war. Uh, of course, there are a lot of people who did not like it. They don't want their hero to die being executed. So they think uh, this story should not be told this way. That is that everybody thinks that they have a right to their own history. They can say anything they want. And when somebody say something that's different and that affected their standing of the truthfulness of their story, they were not, not happy at all. And that's one of the reason this story has so many people trying their best to hide the truth. Uh, the truth about this battle is it was fought over 13 day siege. Uh, the Mexican army surrounded this, uh, the Alamo. If you have actually been there, it is a very small mission that was not used as a mission. So it's uh, used as an army post and the Mexican, Mexican troops under President General, okay, here we have this President General. And while John Wayne says he's not, this is not a republic, but I would say it's probably a republic, depending on how you look at it. He's a president, so I assume he was voted, elected to be a president, okay? And he was uh, doing things that people don't like. That's why they say he's a dictator. Partly, I, I don't know, I'm not, I'm no expert, okay. Uh, during the 13 days, there was fierce battle and in the end the Mexican army reclaimed the Alamo mission, 
Uh, we claim is that they lost it, then they claimed it again. So they reclaimed. Uh, when you have a Hai Pu Xin Shen Di, which is a seashore that they fill, then fill it. So it becomes places where you can build or walk on it. That is a, the reclamation of the seashore. Now uh, here we have the reclamation of the animal by Santa Ana's troops. And there are many people on both sides, <laughs> okay? The Texas people, they call them Texians. Huh? At that time, they're called Texians. And now we don't use that word. And the Mexican people who live there, they call them Tejanos. They're Mexican. Huh? So it's Hanos with Te added to it. So you have two groups of people living in Mexico at that time when that land belonged to Mexico. You have Texians who were white Americans and the Tejanos who were Mexicans. And uh, they joined this battle uh, either because they did not like Santa Ana or they did not want to lose their property right of owning slaves or whatever. So uh, after this battle, lots of people, or during the battle, many people were killed uh, very cruelly by Santa Ana's troops. And uh, these people who were against him, they joined the Texian army, that is the side of uh, John Wayne's side, David Crocker's side. However, he died and they joined the army of Houston and Austin. These are the Texian armies. And in the end, they were able to succeed and Texas became an independent country. It did not become part of America at that time. So they became an independent country and it was the only independent country in the United States that was once independent, okay? So the rebellion ended when the Texians won. And when you talk about the real history, you don't say that it's Texas, Texan or Texian, Texian, Texas people, they want to become a new country, but you have to put it into context that they want to be out of the country of Mexico. So this country is called Mexico. You have a map that is Mexico nowadays from this line down and uh, up to this part, okay. So currently you have Mexico as big as this. However, there are so many different parts. This part was is now part of the United States. You have California, you have New Mexico, you have uh, New Philippines, okay, that's probably, which one is Texas? <laughs> I guess this part is, oh, okay, this, this is Texas, yes. Texas, Arizona, and uh, California. These are now part of U United States. However, in the past, long before Mexico was occupied by the Spanish people, this were all indigenous people and the Spanish came after Columbus and they gradually established their government, which including many, many parts, including this part that is called Spanish Mexico, which included this part of America and this part of Central America. And even this part that is uh, uh, Panama and the Colombia and uh, uh, Brazil, no, that's not Brazil, that's uh, uh, Venezuela and so on. So it goes way down there. So the so-called Spanish Mexico is one huge country, okay? 
So for people to say, Texas wants to be independent, you have to know that it wanted to become independent from Spanish Mexico, which became Mexico after 1822 or something. Uh, I've stated many times that the entire Latin America revolted in the, from 1818 or 1820, and they all became independent in 1822 or 23, except for Jamaica. I don't know, I don't know, but Jamaica, Jamaica become part of the British Empire, but Cuba and uh, uh, Santo Domingo, they were independent. Anyway, so the point is, this is called the Mexico and it owned Texas at the time. At that time, most people were from Mexico or from Spain, but more and more new people came from America who are white Americans because they were attracted by a lot of good land cheap land, free land. And uh, Mexico welcomed them because with them on the northern border, they kept Mexico safe from the indigenous people. So these people are welcome in their country. Okay. Uh, white American immigrants came huh? and many became ranchers and the cotton farmers who relied heavily on slaves, but the world have moved away from slavery. As early as 1806 or something, many countries already started the movement of uh, abolishing slavery. Uh, in Europe, like in England and other countries, they put into law to stop slavery as early as 1820 or 30. There were several movies about that, about England's abolitionists. Uh, however, America was one of the very, very latest to renounce slavery, mainly because half the country depended totally on the slaves to work on the cotton farms and in the mines and in many other places. And there, their bosses, white Americans, owner of slaves and the industries and the farms, they just would not let free, free labor go away with the law. The, but the world has moved away from slavery. Other country already banned it. And uh, Mexico, as I just mentioned, they fought for their independence and chased the Spanish people away. And they wanted to have a new country established with a constitution written. And in writing that constitution, they decided to spell out the abolition of slavery. Uh, so their independence war was succeeded in 1821. And they want to write the constitution, which included abolition of slavery. And the Mexican government struck a deal with Austin uh, to allow the settlers to keep their slaves, but banned any further trade. Uh, so in the year 1822, which is the second year after they become independent, they made a deal with Stephen Austin who is called the father of Texas to allow these American people who have slaves to continue to have those slaves, but not to buy or import more slaves. So that is a great compromise for them. That was in 1822. But the government was not stable and people kept changing and the government was not stable and uh, uh, the, the deal made between these two people became problematic. So 
two years later in 1824, a new government proposed a measure and uh, they want to ban slavery up totally, no matter how, how long you kept the slaves. That's two years later. And they say any slave who came to on the soil of Mexican land are free by the act of being here because this is a free country for slaves. <laughs> All the slaves are free as long as they land on our land. So the constitution Uh, so there's a lot of arguments so at that time in 1824. It's sort of a state by state. If you li live in this local government who, which allowed you to have slaves, then you can't have slaves. But overall, the, the country has a, a law that's against slavery. Then a few years later in 1828, the Texans people in Texas they decided to just ignore this law totally. This practice is unsustainable. That is, you cannot do this on the long run. In the long run, something is gonna happen. You cannot just importing and using slaves uh, with no limitation because the law is already there. So it becomes more and more of an issue. And the, the Mexican government finally outlawed slavery in 1832. That's more than 30 years before the United States. For Texas colony leader Austin, this was the last straw. At this mo moment, when Mexican government finally outlawed the slavery, uh, the, the people who live in Texas, they say, no way, we are not going to stay in this country anymore. We want to become a free country. We don't want to be Mexican. And of course the country that they live in would want them to be, stay in. So there was battles here and there. And their claim was that they won this war because they want to preserve their natural rights and their property which is a catch word for slavery. Uh, and in Washington, DC, they are aware of such things and the issues and their claims. And the one famous person was John Quincy Adams, who was once uh, the president of the um, United States, who after he, his tenure as a president, he became, uh, I think he was a congressman, yeah. And he said, this shameless war is a war for the reestablishment of slavery where it was abolished. He means that all over the world, people know it was wrong to have slavery. And many countries that allowed slavery are now becoming slave free. They start to abolish the law, uh, uh, abolish the practice of slavery. And this Texas instance is the only place in the whole world where a place that is free of slavery wants to go back to become a country with slavery. So that's the view of Texas, uh, of Washington. People in Washington, DC, uh, they were just flabbergasted by this situation. On the one hand, this is a large land, a lot of people and resources, and these group of people wanted to get away from Mexico. They're kind of happy about it because in the end, these all these land became part of the United States, but they were ashamed to see these American immigrants in the foreign country would fight the government to in order to hold on to slavery. Okay, this article was dated June 10th, 2021. So this thing is quite well known within the academic establishment. However, no ordinary people were always brainwashed by John Wayne type of uh, narrative and they did not know. And it comes to the Wall Street Journal. And I also read 
around that time, an article on Time magazine. And uh, here's another map. Oh, God, okay. Uh, the territory. This is uh, currently the green part is Mexico. And in the past, this part, part this very large part that belonged to the United States, right? The United States was part of Mexico. And this part was also part of Mexico at that time. And they gradually became independent, leaving Mexico as well. Uh, when it comes to the former president who then became representative John Quincy Adams, there was this Stephen, uh, <coughs> Stephen Spielberg movie called Amistad. That was a story uh, about a slave ship revolt and an important role in this movie is John Quincy Adams played by Anthony Hopkins. That was also a, a movie that's related to this kind of slavery in, not in Africa, not in America, but somewhere else near us. Actually, this ship actually went all the way up down into New England. So the argument in that movie it was, um, in that story was, this ship that holds slaves, who, which country's law would apply to a ship, that Spanish ship or Portuguese ship, or that was heading for Mexico, or it came to United States, which law would apply? And the John Quincy Adam was, of course, a lawyer arguing the case. And now we come to the legend. Now that we have created this legend that is against the truth, that were not, and many, many, many people did not like this new discovery of this truth. They say, I want my truth. I don't want the stories to be told any other way. Uh, for example, in the state of Texas, they passed a law about critical race theory. That's about race, racial racism. Uh, after George Floyd's death, they, the, the state of Texas advocates the stance that our education, when it comes to history, we should teach stories the way that our students feel they like. We should not tell them to be ashamed to the past. They should not feel that their ancestor did something wrong. So our history, to be our history, it has to be wrong, actually. It has to be not the fact. We want it our way, okay? That is a very strong uh, stance of American people at this time, especially after Donald Trump uh, said all those wrong things that were lies and they felt they like it, that people like it, okay? So this article is that you have your choice of history, whether you want it true or whether you want it the way you like it. Now, this is on Time Magazine very recently. Uh, they, are, they have a phrase called our line in the sand. So we draw a line in the sand, which means on this argument, we do not allow any dispute beyond this point or our, our stand is here. And this is our last line. You cannot go over line to correct us or something. This is called a line in the sand. And there are several different ways to interpret this thing. Here is the, the Texas is trying, a Texas law is, the law in Texas is trying to pass this thing about teachers should not teach children to feel bad about themselves. 
uh, about the line in the sand, the first meaning is of a point beyond which one will proceed no further. This is a line I will not cross, okay? Another meaning is that the point beyond which once the decision to go beyond is made, it's, uh, the, the consequences are permanently set, settled. It's irresistible. Uh, this is a thing, okay? Let's go back to the last one, which is Gong Liu, huh? And I'm not going to read the, this whole thing and not to try to explain because I don't know much about it either. And this is a very, very long poem as far as a, a poem in Shi Jing is concerned. And when you put it this way, you can see that each stanza is this long. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six. However, if you follow those uh, periods, then the length are somewhat different. If you put it this way, you have some long, like, longer lines and some shorter lines, and it goes like this. But it's still the same, exactly the same way. So this is a very long story with six stanzas, and it's telling you about an ancestor, a hero, a godlike hero in the history of Zhou Dynasty, whose name is Gong Liu. When in the beginning, this tribe lived in northern Shanxi, and the Gong Liu was their leader. You can say it's the king or the, the president, whatever. Gong Liu is a hero in this epic poem. And the story says how he restlessly worked hard to accumulate the food and the weapon and the, so that they can all move from this place to the next place possibly because the barbarians at the border are trying to invade them. Anyway, this story is about Gong Liu took the people and moved the capital to a new place. How they constructed the city, how he surveyed the land, how he investigated the flow of the water and how uh, all these difficult things, how he managed to have this new capital established so that this tribe could have a new capital and later on have Zhou Wenwang, Zhou Wang, Zhou Gong, and many other kings afterwards. They all thank to this honest Gong Liu, okay? If you have time, you can read about it. And you can also, of course, Google to find out uh, what it means, okay? All these uh, translation and uh, things like that. But this is, according to my teacher, the only epic you can ever find in the history of China. It, it is admittedly not on such a grand scale like Mahabharata, which has 1.8 million words, but it's considerably long. And it's about one single person with his great accomplishment, what he did uh, in the almost godlike manner. Huh? Uh, it's just to show you something different, OK? I know you're not going to try to memorize it. I don't think you should. OK, so this is for today. Uh, I'm trying to bite off a lot of things <laughs> in one class. <laughs> yeah, but this is the fir first time or last time that I had two pieces of literary work that are so long. I hope in the future we could have poetry that's four lines or six or eight lines that you, re you can really enjoy by reading it or understanding it but this is a, a different class today. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.